reuse them immediately. And you can reuse them on your laptop, creating a complete environment, a complete mirror scaled out of what's going to be running in the cloud. Um, so this creates all kinds of possibilities. This, this is an example of how you'd use Juju. So I'm going to create a little service. Um, it's a Node.js service. I'm going to use something called Subway, which is, uh, which is a great little IRC client, HTML5 IRC client. It uses Mongo as a, as a, as a um, data store. So what's going on here? All we're doing is we're, we're deploying Mongo. Um, we are then deploying Node and telling it through some config that we want to pull in an app and then telling it that we want to call that node uh, in the graph subway. Uh, and then we're connecting um, all of those pieces. So we use Juju charms. Now, a charm is just a distillation of ops goodness. Uh, we have packages for binaries, and we have charms for all of the operational goodness that goes into that. Um, so I'm deploying the Mongo charm. Then I'm deploying the node app charm and telling it I'm going to call it subway. Um, and then I'm going to deploy, and then I'm going to tell those two to connect to each other. And that's literally all I have to do. So um, what would it look like? Well, I have it running over here. Um, if I just do that, you can see that on, in memory, I have a bunch of different containers. We've done a lot of work on, work on Linux containers. So in memory, I have a bunch of different, almost like virtual machines, but much more lightweight. And you can see that they have different IP addresses. They're all connected up. Um, the sum total of the work to create that is, is what I showed you. Um, and you can see down here that, uh, that Subway itself has got its own IP address, so I can go and have a look at that. Um, well, it's already there. And I know it's on port 3000. Yeah, life. And so, uh, and so there it is running. So that's running live in memory. I can scale it out. I can um, add units to it. So, for example, if I wanted to, to tell that Mongo charm that I wanted to scale it out, I could say something like juju add unit. Uh, whoops. Um, to, and I think that would give me a little bit of happiness. Um, I can also visualize this. So, um, uh, This is a little command that will show you essentially what's running um, in a nice in a nice kind of environment. Okay, so uh, let's just kill that. So development's about iterations, right? There's iterations on your desktop. Then there's iterations in tests, and now suddenly you have handovers as well. Um, and ultimately, iterations all the way through to production. And we measure velocity by saying, how fast can you get from development of a new feature to you happy with it, to testing is happy with it, till production is happy with it. And Juju is all about dramatically, radically, by an order of magnitude, cutting the friction um, and therefore increasing the velocity, reducing the time that it takes you to iterate in development, iterate through test, and iterate into production. And the interesting thing is that um, each of those things happens in a different place. So we had to make Juju so that you could deploy in memory on your laptop, but you could also deploy to the cloud, and you can deploy to the metal. So you can, you can design this complex topology, that whiteboard in your office, and you can run it in your laptop and then map it to any of those environments, right? So that's why we call Juju DevOps Distilled, because it really gets to the essence of what's going on in DevOps. Um, inside the charm, uh, all, of the, all of the wisdom of the expert who knows how to deploy Hadoop or deploy Cassandra is encapsulated. Um, what's happened here is that we've stepped up a level from configuration management. Um, people have preferences around configuration management. Juju can wrap around any of those. So um, inside that charm, you have to know and express when you're deploying Hadoop, um, how, to, how to configure it the first time, how to configure replica sets, masters, and slaves, and so on. Um, you might like doing that with Puppet, or you might like doing that with Chef, or you might like write, rewriting the configuration files with Perl or Orc or Sed, or however you choose to do it. That's okay. Juju just wraps 
that goodness essentially into the charm and encapsulates it so that you can reuse it so that other people can reuse it as well. Um, and that reuse is at a level that we've never seen before. So instead of Googling around and copying snippets of bash scripts that, that bring stuff up quickly, you're actually able to just reach into the cloud and grab an off-the-shelf charm that does most of what you're likely to want from any one of these kinds of things. There's hundreds of them now, um, and there's a whole community process that's sp spun up around it to, to, to improve the quality of those, to, to give them to, to, for example, build test suites into the charms so that uh, um, they can be tested, to build benchmarks into the charms so that we know how they're improving over time. So go and have a look at jujucharms.com. There's tons of charms there. Um, there's a level of abstraction that's going on. We are um, getting rid of the day where you actually need to know all of the configuration details of some of these complex parts um, because the charm writer will essentially decide that there are a couple of key choices that you have to make. For example, are you, are you wanting to optimize to run that in memory? Are you op optimizing that data store for write throughput? Are you op optimizing it for read throughput? And then inside the charm, they'll do all the work, essentially, to take that high-level choice, which is expressed as a property in the service once you've deployed it, um, to take that high-level choice and map it into the configuration files that you need. So um, what you really want is you want to use the charm that was written by the guy who wrote the book with the animal on it, right? All of that wisdom distilled down into something that you can just deploy. Deploy Tarsus or uh, deploy the elephant. Um, good charms today are starting to do some amazing things. For example, they will let you, as a property, they will let you say where the binaries should come from. So, for example, you can d deploy a media wiki, which is a big, complex bear of an application when you scale it out, and then you can go onto the, the media, wi media wiki uh, node in the graph, which might be scaled out to, to 10 units or 20 units, and you can say, look, I actually want to see how this is running with tip. And so changing one property in the charm deployment, which you can do in real time, essentially runs out to version control, pulls down the latest version of media wiki, does whatever needs to be done in terms of compilation, puts it in the right place, restarts it, you hit refresh in your browser, and, and your entire infrastructure just moved from uh, the stable package to, to tip. So it's an awesome kind of environment. You can, you, can, you can hack on branches, push those to GitHub, pull those into live running servers. Um, and Juju takes care of all of the complex orchestration, all of the sequencing of who needs to be notified of what change when something's scaling up, when something's scaling down. Um, we're essentially crowdsourcing ops. And that's not something that we've ever done before. We've, we've learned over the years to crowdsource development, um, and we've, we've got all the tools to do that. But for the first time, we're really starting to crowdsource in a really reusable way operational expertise. Obviously, this was born in the cloud. Um, that automation, that reuse um, uh, is, is, is kind of critical to the cloud. But it also has a huge impact on um, the internal development process. It's much easier to do continuous integration if you, if you essentially have um, very easily at your fingertips a complete de deployment environment, or if you can just keep that running in memory on the side. Um, we've seen people bind mounting their, their um, uh, code trees into running memory models um, and setting it up so that every time they save a file, the test suites just start running. So really cool stuff. It really changes the way you're able to deploy. Uh, you can deploy to any infrastructure as a service. This is a little optimistic because Windows Azure is still uh, under development, but Windows Azure is coming. So <clears throat> the goal is to hit any infrastructure as a service. You should be able to take that model, um, draw it on the whiteboard, uh, create it in your laptop, add the parts that are special to you, throw it then to any cloud infrastructure, and of course to the metal, and in that case, any architecture. You may have seen the announcement of uh, OpenStack on Ubuntu um, being spun up on ARM servers provided by Carl Zeta as part of the TriStack initiative. That was all built, spun up with Juju talking to a provisioning server called Maz, Metal as a Service, that essentially allows you to take Juju charms and, and deploy them on physical metal. Uh, so we use that for, for bringing up OpenStack really fast. Um, we showed uh, uh, bringing up an OpenStack cluster in sort of 15 minutes at the OpenStack Design Summit with it. Um, but scaling out Hadoop on the metal, any kind of big data, any sort of uh, uh, rapid deployment where you want to, to, to bring stuff up quickly and then, and then move it around, add to it, subtract from it, um, reconfigure it. Um, the story here is really about um, the full life cycle of the platform. 
Um, we want people to be able to use this from anywhere. So it's been ported to all of the Linuxes, um, Debian, Mac OS X. There's a Windows port in the works as well, as well. So you'll be able to do this from any environment whatsoever. Address any cloud, um, uh, work on any platform. So the full story here is that it's not just about deployment. I mean, you can find a shell script which will deploy Hadoop really quickly for you at scale. Um, but, but the question then comes, how do you use that? How do you scale it up and scale it down? As these infrastructures live in the cloud, they become like gardens, and we have to prune them. We have to weed them. You might want to connect Nagios to a bunch of stuff, and then later on you might decide, no, strip out Nagios and, and, and use New Relic. Um, and that is really easy in a world where you actually have a, a graph that you can work on and tools that are designed to plug it together in that way. So where you really feel the, the benefit is when you've got stuff in production and you want to move it around. Um, there is a, there's a whole category of things that change. Um, Behavior-driven development is a very hot topic. It started as sort of test-driven development, but the, 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 the more deep-rooted thing is how do you coach yourself to work in a way which converges on quality or converges on, on, on velocity? Um, and this kind of tool, people who are into behavior-driven development really love it. Uh, Model-driven deployment is another kind of buzzword. The idea is that you say, look, that's what we're trying to achieve, and let the tools achieve that goal for you, rather than you having to poke around. Um, lots of people talk about AMI soup, um, this idea that you've got tons and tons of AMIs of, of unknown provenance, um, changing in versions, different security status uh, uh, positions. Um, again, Juju makes this a lot easier because you can, you, 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 the, the, the deployment process is entirely transparent. It's source code. Um, it's open source code. So you can, you can essentially see, right, this is how they got from a standard Ubuntu-based image or CentOS-based image, whatever you want, um, to that ultimate working unit, essentially, in the deployment. And it lets you do some things that we've kind of dreamed of for a long time. So right now, for example, I have that same, I have that same set of things running um, in, in um, EC2. So if I just go and take a look at this, uh, I can do, let me just check that it's still running. So this is not going out to EC2. Taking a look at the, at the infrastructure over there, it'll come back and tell me what's running in EC2 in a second. Um, and there you go, it looks very, very similar, very familiar. Um, I have an empty space um, over at HP. HP just brought up a great um, OpenStack cloud, um, really, really fast. It's good fun to use, and uh, Juju talks to it. So um, that's an empty environment, essentially. Now, imagine that I could essentially just map what was running in EC2 to what was running in, um, in HP. Well, in a Unixy kind of world, that would look something like this, right? We'd, we'd, we'd say um, cat file one to file two. Um, and instead, we can actually say that as something a bit like this, right? So Juju export production um, and then import it on the other side into HP, um, in, into the HP environment that I created. So I'm going to do that now. Before I do that, I'm actually just going to... Um, Go and have a look and, and just visualize what's going on. It helps to see. I think that will do the trick. So this will give me a visualization of that of that environment. You can see that there's there's not a lot happening there right now on HP. Um, but if I if I go and uh, uh, map that over. So what I'm doing is I've got stuff running in production in EC2. I saw on the weather report that there's this uh, scary thing called a direct show headed straight for the data, data center. And so with one command, I'm essentially going and fetching all of that production infrastructure and mapping it over to, um, to HP. And if I take a look at the visualization, you'll see that stuff flowing in now. So in sort of real time, we've mapped running infrastructure from uh, one cloud out there in the sky to a completely different cloud on a completely different platform, a completely different technology, from a completely different company, which is pretty cool. So four years ago, we set a challenge for Ubuntu, and we said, okay, we, we, we want to get into design. We want to bring design to open source. 
Um, we want to really sh focus on the user experience, and we want to innovate. We want to see if we can get ahead of Apple, get ahead of Microsoft. This is a time of profound change. We should, um, we should take the initiative.